Uh, awesome. So we're going to have just a, a quick prayer to open things up here for the lesson today. Um, can't go wrong with prayer. Got a lot of prayer today. Prayer is good. Lord God, all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, Lord God Almighty, God, we thank you for just uh, an incredible day, God, for uh, just giving us a place to worship you, God. We know in some countries, even in Haiti, God, their churches are probably destroyed. Their hearts are probably troubled, God. There's countries where it's illegal to worship you, God. There's there We could be in places in our life where we would be so crushed by the world, so captive to Satan, that we wouldn't even be able to pray to you or worship you and sing praises to you, God, at all. And God, we just thank you for being with us, God, for giving us true freedom through your son, God, for showing us a new way of life, and God, for uh, showing us how to live, uh, just giving us a new start, no matter what our background was, no matter where we've been, God. You make all things new in your time, and I thank you for that time today. So, God, uh, we praise your name. We worship you together as a family this morning, and we know that there are your children all over the world right now worshiping you, praying to you, reading your word, and being transformed by you, God. And we're grateful to be part of what you're doing all over the world. Uh, so pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Um, so, guys, I wanted to open up this morning with a, a speech. And uh, I didn't write the speech, but I edited the speech. Um, but I'm just going to read it for you. It's kind of intense. So I want to give you a heads up. It's kind of intense. It's called, If I Were the Devil. Yeah. Oh, I love that speech. All right. Okay, so it says here, If I were the devil, if I were the prince of darkness... I'd want to engulf the whole world in darkness. And I'd have a third of its real estate, four-fifths of its population. But I wouldn't be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree, you. So I'd set about however necessary to take over the United States. I'd subvert the churches first. I'd begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I would confide that what is bad is good and what is good is boring. And the old, I would teach to pray after me, our father who are in Washington, who are in capitalism, who are in my bank accounts. And then I'd get organized. I'd educate the authors, the songwriters, in how to make violence and sexually explicit content exciting and appealing so that anything else would appear dull and uninteresting. I'd flood TV with dirtier movies. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of influence, and I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families at war within themselves, churches at war within themselves, uh, and nations at war with themselves, until each in its turn was consumed. And with promises of higher ratings, I'd have mesmerizing media fanning the flames. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine young intellects, but neglect to discipline emotions. Just let those run wild until before you knew it, You'd have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. School zones would turn into war zones. Within a decade, I'd have prison systems overflowing. I'd have judges promoting, promoting pornography. Soon, I could evict God from the courthouse, and then from the schoolhouse, and then from the House of Congress and the government, and in his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion. I deify science. I would lure priests and pastors into misusing boys and girls and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a Coca-Cola bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and I'd give to those who want until I'd killed the incentive and the ambition and the discipline. And what do you bet I could get the whole state Old states to promote deceit as the way to get rich. I would caution against extremes in hard work and idealism, in moral conduct, 
the only opinion that I would tolerate would be tolerance of all opinions. I would convince the young that marriage is old fashioned, that sex is more fun, that that what you see on TV is the way to be. And thus I could undress you in public. I could lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I just keep right on doing what he's doing. This was written by a American radio personality, a broadcaster in 1965. His name was Paul Harvey. And, uh, you know, I, I heard this speech recently, and I was shocked that it was written almost 70 years ago. Because this is more true today, more spot on than it has ever been. It's shocking. And, you know, this morning, I want to remind you that the devil is, in fact, real. And that we are, in fact, in the devil's playground in this world. That is the title of my lesson for you this morning, The Devil's Playground. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Come on, bro. Help us out. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, I'm reading from the NLT. It says, Satan, who is the God of this world? has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Man, this is uh, an awesome passage, and it further illustrates even biblically that, in fact, Satan is the ruler of this world. The scriptures say Satan is the god of this world. He is the one that they worship. And uh, that the world is in fact plunged into darkness, into sin, which is rampant in the earth. And therefore the stink of death always surrounding. This speech here by, by Paul Harvey is more true and in fact, I believe quite prophetic into the days and times that we're living in now. You know, I'm not big on the end times speculation and, and you know, creating this kind of a panic or this uh, sort of ideology that everything's about to, you know, Jesus about to come back. But, you know, I don't know if you guys turn on the news lately, but with the wildfires that are happening in Greece and Turkey, yeah. you guys hear about that? Yeah. There was uh, hundreds of homes and businesses that burnt down across Greece and Turkey. 200,000 acres of forest that was burnt down. 3,000 people had to evacuate their cities on boats going across the, the, the Mediterranean to escape it. I mean, it was literally titled uh, Catastrophe of Biblical Proportions. Yeah. Wow. Then, of course, the earthquake in Haiti just yesterday at 7.2. The damage of that we still are, are not even sure of, but it's catastrophic. Not to mention, we've been in a, a pandemic for the last year and a half of a pestilence that has taken the world by storm, forced everyone inside, isolating the people, causing turmoil in, in, in the communities with the civic disputes and uh, the racial tensions that are flaring, the violence that has had a rise. Man, I don't know how close the end times are, but I'll tell you this much, it's closer than it was yesterday. Yeah. Now, uh, pretty dismal. It's not good. Uh, not really uh, the, the whole point of the message today. So there's some good news here as well. <laughs> and the good news is that amidst the darkness, there is light. Wow. A glorious light. And you know, um, if you turn on a light in a room that's already lit, you barely notice it. Mm -hmm. Right? But if you turn on a light in the pitch black, it shines even brighter, even more glorious. That's why we notice the stars at night, because it's on a, a back cast of, of just pure darkness. And they shine so bright, and they're brilliant. And don't you just look at the stars, and you're in awe of how incredible and how amazing they are. And that is the light of the good news of Jesus Christ that shines among the darkness. Wow. Amen? Come on. Come on. 
Now, uh, something really cool about the good news is that good news is brought by a messenger. Who are the messengers of the good news? The people of God, the disciples. Yeah, and you know, even this Friday, uh, and even in our Bible talk yesterday, Jermaine and Jess's Bible talk, the, the social light Bible talk. Come on. It's a nice little play on words there. Uh, it was incredible just to see the disciples filled with the joy of their salvation and the message about Jesus go into places where people are living completely worldly lives, consumed in the darkness that is this world, and to see it, it change the people around them. Yeah. You know, it was awesome just, just being around like other groups of people and watching them put a smile on their face just by being near us. The disciples are dancing, they're laughing, they're pure hearted, and and that energy is felt by people around them. And the same at at Sierra Green yesterday. You know, so it's so true that, that good news is brought by the disciples. You know, the children of God, people of the light. And uh, I want to share a couple of scriptures with you here. In uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1 verse 9. It says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. No, the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but they did not receive him. Yet... To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Pretty incredible. And it describes who Jesus is and what his role is on the earth. He came to bring light to a dark place. And not only that, but to give those who would answer the call the opportunity to become children of God and children of light as well. Not born of human decision or of, of natural order, but by, uh, by the will of God, right? In becoming true disciples of Jesus. In John chapter 8, verse 12, you don't have to turn there, but it says, Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness again, but will have the light of life. Ooh, that's awesome. And uh, my first point for us is people of the light. Come on, bro. People of the light. You know, I think Malik's uh, communion message was, was exactly that sort of uh, progression yeah. that all people go through. And, and it, you know, it works something like this. You come into the world and you're pure and you're innocent and you're full of light. Your heart is good. You're full of love. You, know, you don't know any anything different. You're not familiar with darkness. It's a foreign concept. You look at a baby and you're like, man, that is the purest thing I've ever seen. Right? We just naturally understand that's who they are. It's beautiful. So you come into the world, you're full of light. Then you grow up in the world that is governed by sin, and it starts to seep into your spirit. And that process is a little bit different for all of us. And each one of us have our own story of losing our innocence. You know, the saying that we're products of our environment is very true. What we're surrounded by, what we're around, it just gets in there. There's, there's no avoiding it. I, I, uh, I like barbecuing, right? So I was thinking, what's a good analogy? This one marinating a steak, right? You throw it in the fridge overnight, whatever you put it in, it's going to get some of that flavor in there. You can't avoid it, you know. And like uh, maybe, maybe uh, like t- like dyeing a T-shirt. Right? You throw a, a white T-shirt in dye. What is going to happen? The dye is going to get in there, and it's going to turn that T-shirt whatever color the dye is. Wow. It's inevitable. That's what's going to happen. Wow. So when we're marinating in darkness, that darkness will absolutely seep into our soul and change us whatever color it is. And and the thing that is so deceptive and so damaging about it is that we learn to operate in darkness. And we don't think twice about it. We don't know any difference. 
We see things that we never wanted to see. We feel things that we never wanted to feel. And we've done things that we never wanted to do. That's what happens. It's not good. But, you know, I'll tell you this. The world is temporary. Yep. All these yep. things are temporary. And they're, they're scheduled to burn. Yep. They so will change. I love the Batman quote. Uh, the, the dawn is darkest before the break of day. Yeah. Right? And on, that Batman. is a fact as well. Yep. But the world is temporary. And Satan does a very good job at deceiving us to buy into it and to think there's no other way. You know, the, the devil uses temporary things to get you to make permanent decisions. A season is going to change. But in a state of hopelessness, we just submit and subside that this is my life, this is my lot, this is how it will be till the day that I die. Hold on. That's a lie from Satan. Yeah. It's a lie. Change is going to happen. And you know, for me, one day in my darkness, in my worldly life, uh, someone opened up a Bible and showed me the Word of God. Maybe some of you have had that experience. Yeah. And you were you were looking at the scriptures and, and somebody helped you to put the scriptures into your heart. And they got in there and they did something supernatural to your spirit. And they start to transform you from the inside out. Mm -hmm. The good news begins to take root and do what it's meant to do, which is push out the darkness to heal the wounds, to bring hope where there is no hope, to put faith where there was no faith, to give you joy where there was no joy, and to give you love where there was no love. That's what it does. The Bible is awesome. It demolishes strongholds, it breaks chains, and it turns darkness into light. Wow. You know, when that starts to happen, that spiritual awakening the world starts to make a little more sense. Yeah. Right? You see the sin that corrupts. You yeah. see the spiritual forces, the authorities in this world, and how they've manipulated and controlled and suppressed the, the you know, even our families, the governments, the mm -hmm. nations, throughout all of history. Things start to make sense when you understand that Satan is running the show. I mean, man. I remember for me, it felt like the veil had been lifted. Yeah. Right, that veil of darkness that clouds everything and makes the world confusing and scary and hopeless and depressing. Well, it started to get lifted. Right? And the world was still dark. But I started to understand why. And to have hope. You see, you have a, a decision to make. To either continue to walk in darkness or... To expose and forsake your darkness and come into that true light that has been shown to you. Turn with me here to John chapter 3. Come on, bro. Come on. John chapter 3, in verse 3, it's Jesus talking to Nicodemus. He says, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born unless they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Jesus here is setting up the world for transformation. He's giving them an avenue to come out of darkness and into light. And here he's talking to Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee, who's a religious man, who's doing good works, who's mature and knows the word of God. And he says, hey, even you must be born again. Nicodemus is very confused by this. It would make sense later on that Jesus was talking about the new covenant that he would establish. His death on the cross and our participation in that death through baptism that would bring us into the kingdom of God. Wow. As he talks about here, to enter the kingdom. 
You must be born again. Yeah. Now it's very exciting uh, to see uh, and to hear that Alexis and Mary have come. <laughs> 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 but you know that that is no easy decision. It's no light thing. Nope. And, and I know because I've been there as well. Many of you have. Um, it's not a walk in the park coming out from darkness into the light. Satan does everything in his power to keep you in those chains, to deceive your mind and reinforce a lie so that you will not forsake your darkness. Look here at John 3, uh, verse 19, just a little bit further on. Come on, bro. Where he's speaking to Nicodemus. Come on. In verse 19, it says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it will be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. That's awesome. That's awesome. And here, once again, reiterating that same idea that you're born into the light. You become a child of God, a child of light, until you're, until then, and this is the, the shocking part that's kind of hard to sit with, until that point, you're not a child of God. You're God's creation. God still loves and cares for all of his creation. But you're not a child of God until you move out from the darkness and into the light. Mm -hmm. In God, there is no darkness. In God, there is no sin. So we have to then be transformed, be born again. What is that? You're becoming a new child, not of the darkness, but now of the light. Mm -hmm. Right? It's crazy because even Jesus calls the Jews children of the devil. Because they would not believe in him and come into the light. In John 8, 42 through 47. Uh, Satan takes us captive and God calls us back home. The challenge here from this point is to give up the darkness. Now that should seem obvious, but man, it is easier said than done. Because these are patterns and these are things that have been seeping into our spirit and our soul for however many years you've been alive. And it's like breaking off a bad relationship. It's scary. What am I going to do without these things that I'm so familiar with? Like, that's why people stay in bad relationships because yeah. it's familiar. It's predictable. There's some kind of security or reliability there. So they don't give it up. They stay in an abusive and destructive relationship sometimes until the day they die or until the very relationship kills them itself. Yeah, come on, bro. Yeah. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. But the challenge here is to come into the light. Wow, 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 Get your wow. salvation for the love of God, <laughs> literally. Get your salvation. Confess your sins and be baptized. That is the message of John 3. Now, imagine this. Jesus comes. He, he establishes this new covenant. He gives us this new way of life. He, he shows us the path to salvation. And now you have all these people coming out of the darkness into the light. And it's creating a community of people. That uh, want nothing to do with darkness. And who are part of the kingdom of God. The body of Christ. The church. Right? That's what that is. Right? God looks down at, his, at the earth. And he sees all the darkness that just all over the earth. And among the darkness like the stars are these specks of light that are his people. Who have his very spirit inside of them. Pure and shining with the very light that is his son and his love. And he sees that on the earth. And it's far and few between. Now, what happens when you get a bunch of those lights and you put them all together? Mm. Right? They shine even brighter. Shine bright, they like shine even brighter. What happens, like, does anyone like fire here? I know my brother, you know, and, you know, some sisters over there. You know, there's something. I know, Dean, you love fire. I know. Dean, <laughs> Dean's fired up. No pun intended. Uh, I know. I know. Sam loves fire. We've had some good fires in our day. 
and broke down a whole entire tree one time and put it in the fire. It was great. Um, but what happens when the fire starts to go out? You just have embers. There's a bunch of sparks. Well, all these little lights, they start to dwindle. When you put them back together, you pile them up, the fire ignites again. And then that fire can, can set something else on fire. And before you know it, you have like a, a raging light that is so bright and so out of control that man, nothing can stop it. That is the people of God. Wow, wow, wow. That is the people of God. My second point for you is set the world on fire. Yes. So, you know, I've been reading through the book of Acts. It's an awesome book. And it talks about the, the, the spread of the first century church. Like when these events first happened, God set up, Jesus set up the new covenant. The first people, 3,000, you know, the Holy Spirit comes down on them flames and they baptize 3,000 people and God's looking down and there's this big explosion of fire on the earth. Everything else is still dark, but right there is burning brightly and it's awesome, right? The first fire that God started through Jesus on the earth through his people, the people of light. Come on, bro. And, um, you know, from there, the church grows exponentially. It, it, it covers the whole city of Jerusalem. I mean, you look at the chapters, it's like, okay, there's 3,000, then there's 5,000, then there's 7,000. But just at the same time that the church is growing and the fire is becoming greater, the darkness is trying to smother it and put it out. Woo. You look through the book of Acts. It's God does a miracle. The people see something uh. incredible happen, and Satan comes back hard with two punches to try to take him down. It's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The whole time, up to the very end of the book, there's no break. There's no victory. There's always Satan trying to take out the people of God, but the people of God getting uh, further and growing the kingdom even greater every single time. Man. So it's, it's always growing, but it's always being persecuted. It's Woo. always being tried to, to tear it down. It doesn't stop, even to this very day. We're in a spiritual battle. You know, in the first century with Jerusalem, it culminated in Stephen being the first martyr. They killed him. They stoned him to death. They took him outside and threw rocks at him until he died. They murdered him because he advocated for Jesus and he would not forsake his faith. That's pretty bad. It's pretty rough. Someone was killed. You know, when we landed here in Philadelphia, we had a campaign that was Philadelphia's first fire. Yeah. And we kind of wanted to parallel the start of the first century church and the start of the church here in Philadelphia. It's just that they saw a great boom. We wanted to see a great boom. And in fact, we did. Yeah, we, did. You know, we had all kinds of <laughs> baptisms every single week Woo! for months. We saw some incredible yes. miracles. But sure enough, the persecution right on the tail every single time. <laughs> Well, we'll check out this here in Acts chapter 8. against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered through Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Then it killed Saul and then it just keeps getting worse. Or Samuel. Stephen. Something with an S. Stephen. They killed Stephen and, and it gets worse. Verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. 
the response from the disciples, from the people of light, was to scatter and continue preaching the word. Right? Imagine again, we're back at that campfire, and you've got this this fire going, and then you scatter the embers all over the grass. You're going to have a bunch more fires. That fire is going to spread, and that's exactly what happened. There was a second fire that spread through the whole world, and just in about 25 years from this point, the scripture is saying, Colossians chapter 2, that they had evangelized the entire world in their day. Every creature Ooh. under the sun had heard the good news about Jesus. Man, come on. And that was spurred, that was triggered by the persecution itself. So I want to tell you something right here. There's about to be a second fire here in Philadelphia. You know, there's been persecution, there's been hardship. And what do disciples do in response to hardship and persecution? Well, they multiply. They spread out physically. And they preach the word of God, and the fire grows even bigger. It was awesome to see the baptism of Dang just last week. Dang, I'm getting our Lord. That was awesome. Yeah, and then to see the global leadership or the, the World Missions Jubilee last weekend, and see the churches growing all over the world. Yes. As a movement, we're about to hit ten thousand in the Lord. It's amazing. And watch what happens in Haiti after this earthquake. I bet you, you'll see a tremendous growth in the church. I guarantee you, we'll see that. You know, with two more baptisms today, and who will be next after that? Well, I don't know, but I bet you there will be many. Because God is doing something great here in Philadelphia. Something is about to happen here in Philadelphia. A fire is starting, and it will not be stopped. It will be even greater than the first. All to the glory of God. You know, Luke 12, verse 49, Jesus says, I have come to ignite a fire on the earth, and how I wish it was already kindled. Well, the fire is the kingdom of God, and it is here. You know, my challenge to close out this point here is to get on fire for God and to spread that fire everywhere you go. You know, what is the fire that I'm talking about? It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. You know, even in our, our conference last weekend, yeah. there was an incredible message about the Holy Spirit. And, uh, man, how can we carry out a supernatural task by natural means? Man. It's impossible. It's impossible to die. We have to rely on yeah. God's power, on his spirit, on that fire that ignites us from the inside out, transforms our hearts, gives us a, a new way of thinking, and the power to overcome our weaknesses, our trials, anything that Satan would throw at us, that's how you do it. Do not quench the fire, the Spirit of God in your life. We got to get deeper in prayer, deeper in reading, and, and have a conviction about sharing our faith every single day. Amen. A conviction about stoking that fire every single day. A conviction about doing follow-ups and Bible studies with yeah. people every day. Because what happens if you leave a fire alone? Let's say you start something with somebody, you share a word, you give them a little seed of faith, and then you just leave it alone. It will go out. Yeah. Absolutely will go out. The love of most will grow cold. Without that continued fanning into flame by God's people who are on fire, bring, again, these things, to, you bring two ambers together, it's hotter. It's more light. That's what we must do to build this church and to change Philadelphia. Come on, bro. Uh, the church, uh, church, we have a world to turn upside down. Mm. Right? And I want you to understand the gravity of that and the, the, uh, the adventure of that. That's exciting. It is. It's pretty awesome. I, I actually believe with all my heart that we will, in fact, change the world. It, it's going to happen. Not because I'm anybody great, but because God is great, and that's his plan. Come on. And all we got to do is take his hand and walk by faith and by his spirit and his power. This will happen. Jesus says, take heart. I've overcome the world. It's already done. But you got to get on the train. You're going to miss it. He, he can use you or he'll use somebody else. 
But man, I don't want to be that guy. And I miss the train. You know, two things. Two things will put the fire of God out in each one of our hearts. Two things. Sin and unconfessed sin. Oh, man. Man, man, man. Kind of related. Uh, turn with me here to 1 John. We were doing a study with, with, with Cassius the other day, and I told him, turn to, uh, you've heard about the Gospel of John, but there's a secret John in the back of the Bible. 1 John. <laughs> That's not really a secret. It's, it's just right back there. You can turn right to it. No problem. But First John chapter 1 and verse 5. Uh, it says here, This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we live, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Wow. So, church, uh, this passage here is written to the church right so you know getting baptized all that is awesome but that's literally the front door yes. of our walk with god only the front door you know you get you get all the sins washed away away you enter that covenant you receive the holy spirit now the darkness is gone so god can actually make his home inside of you with his light you can have unity with god through his spirit and then the fellowship of the, the believers as well because you have the same spirit one body one church one heart one mind one purpose but it says hey be careful be careful because you can so easily slip back into darkness yeah, yeah. it's very easy to do uh, my last point here is always walk in the light come on bro now uh I have a little analogy that I like about this. Uh, something we're all familiar with. Does anybody get any kind of notifications on their cell phone? Yeah, all the time, right? Is it like kind of annoying for people, right? It like makes us anxious sometimes where we see you have you know 20 unread messages, right? In your text message box. Then you're getting notifications from Instagram. So and so message you. You have this, you have that. And there's all these things, all these these black, unread things in your inbox. The same thing with Facebook. You know, even my physical mailbox, people put stuff in there, and I gotta take it out because it's just sitting in there and it gets filled up and it bothers me. Right? I mean, if you just if you don't do anything, that thing just overflows to mess. It's horrible. Now, uh, how about people's <laughs> emails? Woo! All right. I'm trying to figure out how they got my email. <laughs> Yeah, some of you have way too many unread emails. And I know because I bet this has happened to some. Hey, can I borrow your phone? Can I borrow your computer to check my email real quick? And you take a look over, they leave it open, and there's like 10,000 unread emails. And somebody, and you're like, man, at least I'm not that bad. You try not to judge them in your heart for having so many unread emails. That might be sick. That might be sick. You know, I'm, I'm, you know so here's the thing. Here's the thing. They, they literally come on black, unread, unopened, and it weighs you down and it gives you anxiety and it's just kind of irritating. It bothers you. So that you just want to delete the whole app completely. Well, that's what happens when we have unconfessed sin Ooh. on our hearts. Ooh. It's dark and it weighs you down and it gives you anxiety and it makes you upset. And sometimes you just, man, I just don't even want to deal with it. I'll just let it just. Do whatever it's gonna do, and I'm just gonna delete that thing in some place. I can't even handle it. It's so overwhelming. Wow. That's what unconfessed sin does to our hearts spiritually. Come on, bro. That's what happens. So walking in the light is just clearing your inbox. Right? And doesn't it feel great when you like get all of your unread messages out? 
Yeah. Right? You go through WhatsApp and you open all those chats and then with all these, all these, there's no messages, zero. And it's just something so light and freeing about that. Same thing with confessing your sin. You just get it off. And man, there is a freedom and a lightness and a joy and a peace that comes from that. But church, unconfessed sin will put out the fire and destroy your relationship with God. And according to this passage, it will destroy your relationship with your brothers and sisters. Yeah. You cannot have fellowship with God, and you can't have fellowship with the body of Christ if you have unconfessed sin. Nope. You cannot. <laughs> uh, I've got one more passage that I want to look at here. In Galatians chapter 5, and we're going we're gonna to close out with this here. Just so we're crystal clear on what is sin. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, it says, The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, or pharmakeia, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. You're in the kingdom of God. You live like this. You're walking right out of the kingdom of God. He's talking to the church. He's talking to saved people. Hey, if you continue to walk in sin, you will lose the light that God put in you. That fire will go out. You'll go from hot to lukewarm, to cold, to, to that's it. It's over. And, you know, I want to point out three specific sins in here that often are overlooked because they seem kind of, like, unusual. Yeah. And that's discord, dissensions, and factions. Ooh, oh, 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 oh. All three of those sins have to do with unity. Yes. They have to do with groups. They have to do with a body of believers or a community or a people or a family. It's talking about the church. Discord, dissensions, and factions. Discord is basically a lack of unity. It's a lack of harmony. It's a musical term. A discord is one that is out of sync with the other chords. Right? It's one that stands out. And, and if it was by itself, it'd be fine. But because it's trying to harmonize with the others and it's not in harmony, it is in discord, which is sin. We have to be totally unified as a body. Mm -hmm. Dissensions is when one among a group starts to gossip and slander and talk about people or situations or things when that person is not around mm -hmm. or in a way that is not productive to build up the body, but in fact is tearing down the body, right? Gossip is when you're talking about anybody who, uh, you're talking to somebody about anybody who doesn't need to know about that person, mm. right? If they're not involved, if they're not going to be part of the process of helping or fixing the problem, you should not be talking to them about that person, right? The Bible's very clear. If you have an issue with somebody, you bring it to the person. Please. Point blank. It's very easy to understand. It's not complicated. Anything else is flat out sin. Um, rumbling is also in dissension. And what happens in a dissension is it creates the third one, which is the faction. Right? You often hear about a faction in a government where there's a, a splinter group that rebels against the government. And then they try to take over the government and, and destroy it and do something different completely. And they corrupt as many as possible in the process. It's often rooted in bitterness. Man, I don't like what you guys are doing, and I want to do something different. Who else is with me? Okay, great. Let's let's uh, go in, and we're going to destroy what's happening here. And here's the thing. They might have a good reason, but that's absolutely sin if that's the way they're going to address it. This destroys the group completely. So um, we got to be totally tight on this. Yep. We got to walk in the light. These sins, and these three in particular, will destroy the church. They will destroy the people of God. Uh, so my challenge here is to support one another, be totally unified, be totally in harmony, as long as it is not sin. Right? Even if you don't like their idea, 
even if you don't necessarily agree with their idea, if it's not sin, get behind it. Mm. Otherwise, you are in sin, mm. and you're disunifying the body, and you're on your way to destroying it. Mm. It could be a, a leader. It could be Deo and I. It could be a Bible talk leader. It could be a discipling partner. It could be something in the movement larger. But if it's not sin, you got to get behind it. Trust God if you don't like it. Um, Amen. The second here is to address sin. Okay, so we're not sweeping sin under the rug by absolutely no means. That is the opposite of what we do in this church. That's why I go to this church, because we actually deal with sin. Yes, we do. Right? We're not going to have any any under the rug scandal or crazy backdoor sort of thing. And that's one thing that actually brings me great security, knowing that God is leading the church and not people. But So if you see sin, bring it to the person that you see the sin with. Right? We actually practice Matthew 18 in this church. If you see a sin, then you go bring it to that brother or that sister. If they don't agree, if they don't like it, you bring somebody else. If they don't like it, you bring it before the church. We actually do that to stay in the light, to keep the body shining brightly and on fire for God. Um, so another just quick practical here is forgive and forgive quickly. Woo! Bitterness is one of the most dangerous sins, and it's usually the root of factions, and it destroys many. Yes, my brother's preaching today. Come on, man. <laughs> also, we've got to be united on the core principles of what we believe in the church, yes. on our purpose of making disciples, evangelizing the world, having discipling relationships. We're actually trying to get better and grow in maturity as a body, yes. as each individual member of the church. Like that is our conviction. Otherwise, what are we really doing? This is not a social club. This is not a community group. We're here as the people of God to actually change the world. Amen. I'm Amen. not saying this for entertainment. I no, know. This is really what we believe. I know. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, another thing that fire does, it, yeah, it shines brightly, but it also refines the one that is on fire yeah. from the inside out. <laughs> Woo! So if you don't want to continue to change, if you don't want to repent, then this is not the place yeah. for you. Wow. Uh, we must have a sold out, give up everything, fully committed, faithfully driven, deep convictions core. That is the body of Christ. That is the church. Yeah. You know, we got to be committed to meetings of the body, to actually meeting yes. together. Yes. I mean, man, we just had a whole conference about how important it is to come together and meet. And I'm so grateful to see all of you here. Man, I'm grateful to see you. You know, we got to be absolutely committed to having incredible personal relationships with God. You know, yeah, we carry each other's burden. Yeah, we help each other. But, man, we got to have a personal love and devotion for God when nobody's looking to. Man. It's so important that we're reading our Bibles. We're in the Word of God, not just, you know, listening to the Word of God or reading a quick scripture or listening to a sermon, but actually getting in the physical Bible or amen you're at. But it, just getting into the word and letting it transform us, letting it cut our hearts. That's that refinement. We can't run away from it. That's that fire that burns within. You know, it says here, the love of most will grow cold. And if you're, uh, you're not on fire for God, you're probably lukewarm. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. And if you're lukewarm, that's one step away from cold or God just spitting you right out of his mouth. He says, I'd rather have you be hot or cold, but since you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Uh, you know, so this is, it's not, it's not a, a thing that you just hope works itself out. It's a sin that needs to be repented of immediately. Wow, wow, wow. Come on, bro. <laughs> my challenge here is uh, to have effective discipling times using the Bible to continue to teach, correct, rebuke, and train in righteousness. All right, basic. Just getting in your Bible and letting it do what it does. Nothing special, nothing extra. Just simply being a disciple and being uh, uh, under the word of God and letting it train you. You know, we're stronger together. We shine brighter together. As a people of light, we're going to set the world on fire in the devil's playground. And uh, with that, uh, you know, let's have an incredible week. Let's go after these things. The God be on